Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Bigotry in America. I'm Jay Fidel. It's the ten o'clock. It's the one o'clock block on a given Monday, a week after the shooting, the the massacre in the temple um, in Pittsburgh, and we're still reeling from that. And there's so much written about it. And we have Peter Hoffenberg, who is a professor of history at UH Manoa, uh, and a member of the Jewish community who does a lot of thinking about this sort of thing, uh, who is here with us. Thank you so much for coming down, Peter. I would say my pleasure, but I would prefer to talk about Jewish humor. <laughs> yeah. But I'm here, yes, right. <laughs> of course. You, you, you call and I come running. Yep. <laughs> Thank you for that. So the first thing we should uh, look at is the, um, the Pittsburgh Gazette, I think it is. Yes. Um, and it's, uh, it's a few days after Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, um, and it's got a, a, a Hebrew headline, which is interesting because, as in most places, the Jews are a minority in Pittsburgh. And somebody put a Hebrew headline right, there. Right, this was the editor's decision. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was a good decision. It's a fine decision. I think he's been applauded throughout for doing this. Yeah. Uh, no guns. Uh, and not only is it the, the Kaddish prayer for the, the dead, and we say it in mourning, but it's actually, uh, if it, when it's translated, it's a celebration of life. So it's actually a very profound uh, front page. They mourn the dead, but the best thing you can do for them is to engage in life, not retreat. <clears throat> So two things have happened, three things since then. One is a lot has been written about anti-Semitism, about Pittsburgh, about this isolated fellow who got on the Gab, the Gab site and sort of drew his sustenance from it. By the way, it's back on the air, you know. Gab is back. Right. Uh, GoDaddy threw him off, threw the domain off, but they came back on the air, I think, this morning or yesterday. Um, so that, well, we could also talk about free speech that, that, that's issues. A, right. uh, uh, they said that's a, that's a win for First Amendment, they said. That's what they said. Um, <clears throat> and I'd like to talk about that. That's one thing. A lot of, a lot of been, had been written. Another is uh, the Jewish people have had a lot of, a lot of soul searching, if you will, and, and candlelight vigils. And you've been to a couple, I'm sure. Uh, I didn't make any, but I, I heard and I got invited to many of them. Um, and I saw the news about many of them. And I guess, um, I guess the, the third thing is that, the, oh, gee, that, the, the, that, that we have all learned that there's more to this than we thought. Our eyes have been opened to um, an underlying anti-Semitism in the country, and maybe in the world, um, that is very troubling. Uh, that's my three things that okay. have happened this week. And that's a, that's a lot. Should we take them one by one? Yeah. So the first one was a lot has been written. Yeah. And a lot has been written from different perspectives. I should say, as I do every time, um, I'm not an official representative of the Jewish community. Uh, as you know, two Jews, three opinions. And I, <laughs> right. I can't hold more than three or four at one time. And <laughs> even though I, uh, it is my great pleasure and honor to teach uh, my students and work with my colleagues, I don't represent the university. So I'm here as a friend of yours and as a person who's very concerned about these issues, yes. uh, but only representing myself and more than happy to talk to people on email, yes. et cetera. So your first point is really well taken, that suddenly, <laughs> for a whole bunch of people, <laughs> there is anti-Semitism, suddenly. Uh, now, the Anti-Defamation League has been monitoring anti-Semitic acts for years. Uh, they showed an uptick of about uh, 55 to 60 percent. That includes actions not only against humans, but of course against property. And among the most common uh, anti-Semitic acts is to desecrate uh, not only synagogues, but of course in the Jewish tradition, the cemetery. I mean, you, you move someplace, the first thing you build is, is a cemetery, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. a fair amount. Um, and the literature has been, if we want to talk a little bit about the literature, I would say um, one, of course, is to uh, try to figure out what motivated this individual. And if this individual is representative of himself, a minority, a wider group. And that's of some significance in part because the legal definition of terrorism in this country. And the legal definition of terrorism in this country, uh, and therefore the resources gone towards acts conceivably uh, identified as terror, are external threats. Even though disproportionately the number of terrorist yeah. attacks have been by uh, white, Christian, generally males in this country. So uh, there's been a very important debate about uh, how to define terror. You know, is this legally? Uh, nobody doubts it's a massacre, right? Uh, secondly, I think there's considerable debate about um, is this an attack on all religions? 
Is it an attack on a sacred space? Is it the same as other hate crimes? Or as many have argued very uh, coherently and I think very powerfully, that it's all of those, but the target uh, targets were Jews and a Jewish institution with somebody who clearly hated Jews and we'll, and we'll talk a little bit about hatred of Jews and hatred of Judaism because they do overlap. And I think that's been an important discussion. So, you know, how to define the acts and how it's connected to other yeah. or potentially. Um, and that's of significance in that uh, if we just think of this as another hate act, um, we're essentially erasing Jews from the story and Judaism from the story. It would be as if you lectured about uh, the slave trade and simply said, well, you know, African Americans were slaves as there were slaves in Rome, as there were slaves in Arabia, <laughs> and nobody would really yeah. think of that. And, and here we have to remember, uh, the victims were marked as Jews. And then um, thirdly, I think it's significant uh, as to, uh, I'm not gonna say moving forward, because moving, it's, you, you can't move forward, but what do we do? Um, and I would like to discuss more what we do as a Jewish community. I know people are voting today, and I don't really want to get into, you know, no, the, vote, no, and the votes. No, I don't, I don't and, either. And I don't think people watching care about my political views. But the concern is personal. I, mean, but, I, I right. don't think, but what, you know, we do what as I've Jews read over is the past to week is it exists, right. it's going right. to continue to exist. There's not a whole lot, uh, you know, that the Jewish people can do to stop this. It's been going on for thousands of years, actually. Uh, well, Robert Wistrich, who's probably second and third foremost scholar of anti-Semitism, uh, calls it the longest hatred. It's, yeah. the lo it's the longest continuous hatred, and the irony of anti-Semitism is you can find it in places where there aren't even Jews. You don't, you don't even have to be Jewish. <laughs> that is irony. Well, there's an old story about uh, the NASA spacecraft that goes up, and after six, seven months, they land on a planet which is inhabited, and they meet, uh, they meet the extraterrestrial beings, and the extraterrestrial beings ask, you know, um, where are you from? Uh, and are there any Jews? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> are you Jewish? <laughs> so it's uh, extraterrestrial as well as terra firma. Yeah. So I'm happy to talk about any of those things okay. you'd like to, whatever well, I, for you. I made a list of, the, of the, the, what okay. comes to mind about what Jews, how Jews react to this. Mm -hmm. um, okay, one is fear. I'm sure that most, uh, most people, most Jewish people in the country, and beyond the country, uh, feel fear, uh, as they do after events like this in Europe. Um, and I, I guess that means you, you, you know, you're more careful. Uh, you don't send your kid out alone. You, maybe you don't go to the temple if there's going to be a lot of people there. Um, maybe you're just more careful and more reserved. And fear can be in many ways. I mean, you can, you can, you can express fear by simply de-identifying as they did in the Inquisition, Spain and Portugal. You know, I'm not Jewish. Or, for that matter, in Germany, I'm not Jewish. Um, of course, uh, the more you would de-identify, the, 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 the more the bigot wants to search you out and find, you know, that you had great-grandparents mm -hmm. who might have been Jewish <laughs> and come after you for that. But I, I see as one thing as fear. And, I mean, I know you want to tell me, Jay, it's going to be all right. This too shall pass. Um, why should I not be afraid, Peter? Why should you not be afraid? Well, I think um, in part because whereas there is anti-Semitism clearly, and clearly there are conspiracy theories and there have been attacks, um, as a couple of scholars have pointed out, and I know people may disagree with this, but uh, actually the instruments of the state the government, the true powers that be, are not fundamentally anti-Semitic. Uh, it makes a tremendous difference. If you, if you look at regimes that have really prospered because their oxygen has been hatred, whether it's racism or anti-Semitism, it is the regime, it's not just society. And a majority of Americans do not abide by these principles. Um, we live in an era where, um, just as it is completely inappropriate and unacceptable to use the N-word in public, it's just not acceptable anymore. Uh, we also live in an era very different than our parents and grandparents, where uh, among most people, explicit anti-Semitic comments 
are no longer acceptable. We have to re, we have to reinforce that. Right. I mean, you go back that to the comes famous up, we have film to like speak Gentleman's to Agreement, for example. Now, I know that there are people watching and listening uh, who will make references about certain political figures, and um, I'm not excusing certain political you, figures. You mean Trump? Well, I don't really want. I mean, I'm sure today. Okay, you but know, that'll be just our right. But but I'm sure that uh, the audience doesn't want to hear another. And and I think that uh, we have an excessive emphasis on him. Excessive, um, but I would say that the the powers that be are not fundamentally anti-Semitic. Now, I would say that the the powers that be uh, at certain times have made devil's pacts with certain groups, not to necessarily explicitly support them, but to perhaps turn their eye from certain attacks. Uh, that's probably true, but I think if you were to compare communities that are under attack. Uh, there are reasons that African-American parents worry about their children getting in a car and driving down the road, or Latino parents in L.A. worry about their children getting on the freeway. We haven't reached that point no. for white Jews. Now, if you were a Latino Jew and you were a black Jew, then, then you, you, <laughs> it you, you yes, it, it, and, and you are potentially. But I think the, the point where um, Jews need to hide, Jews need to make decisions about not going to synagogue. Uh, Jews need to make decisions about wearing yarmulke or not in public. Those those are not really in Remember play. Remember that here. happened in Europe, right? And it was not a Jew who was wearing the yarmulke. He was testing, and he got beat up for right. wearing a yarmulke. And then the and German he... community, though, all wore yarmulkes right, yes, afterwards. Yes. yes. Um, and there are various reasons that people like the French Republic. You know, religion is not a public expression in France supposed to be a secular society. So Jews who determine, say, reform or conservative, determine that they're not going to wear yarmulkes, that's a long-standing Republican tradition. It's mm -hmm. not just under threat. Uh, so if you ask me, do we not, should we not go out? Absolutely not. Should we not go to shul? Absolutely not. I personally don't think we should start arming the synagogues. Uh, we, ha we have had uh, policemen or security guards around synagogues for 20 or 25 years. Some synagogues. Some synagogues, okay. right. I see no reason to go into a hysteria. You know, you, you mentioned that government is not, you know, anti-Semitic. Right. Uh, in the, the very sinews of government, right. But, you know, there are lots of people out there in varying degrees who are anti-Semitic. And sort of like what happened in Yugoslavia, you, you, know, take, the, you take the membrane off and, you know, the historic enmity just pops up at you. Um, and it has to do with people who are disaffected in their lives. So uh, two, two points mm -hmm. I'd like to throw at you. Um, you know, one is um, this, this Gab, this gab right. uh, dot com site that's now up again. It has 800,000 viewers. It's not a small thing. It's not a bunch of, you know, a bunch of crazies in, in a small group. It's, it's an example of social media getting out there and, and cutting a swath in our population. Um, and the other, the other thing uh, you know, I want to mention is that, is that th this guy, um, I'm blocking on his name, Bowers. Richard Bowers, Bowers, as well as the fellow with the bombs, as well as this fellow Mike Enoch, who was the subject of one of those articles in The New Yorker a few days ago, they're, they're disaffected, they're isolated. They don't have any friends. They're a little off, okay? And they get their, what do you want to call it, social sustenance from social media. And it's hard to count them. I say 800,000 because it was in the paper mm -hmm. and surprised me. Um, but it could be that we have a lot more than that, and they can be unleashed, what you call it, activated, okay, by way of social media. And we don't know who they are. Um, they may not know who they are. They may just find themselves drawn to this kind of hate, and it's all by themselves. They don't have any friends who they talk to. They just go to social media. We don't know the, the you know, intensity of that strata because it's dynamic, don't you think? Well, did you have a second question, or do you want me to do that one That's first? It. Okay, so that goes back to our conversation about the book uh, Anti-Semitism, where we talked about before, with the three open parentheses, the journalist who had discovered this uh, vast, uh, not so underground anymore, um, social media connection. So let me make a few comments, none of which are very profound, uh, but, but maybe can lead to more conversation. 
Um, I would be very hesitant to have any restrictions on free speech by any means at all. Um, I know that there are costs, there are always costs to free speech. But historically, historically, once either the government or a company, and I'm not sure we want you know, the company exercising restriction either, um, that's uh, usually a slippery slope. And as Europeans say, the censor always strikes twice. So we may want to censor, and it becomes a very bad precedent to censor, all right? This is not so dissimilar than, than crises that have always erupted when some kind of textual or representational technology has taken off. In the middle of the 19th century, you had to worry about newspapers, right? Should you censor newspapers? Because there were uh, graphic engravings, uh, there was expression in editorials, which could have led to an action, right? Okay, so my response to you is uh, that they probably uh, should be monitored. Certainly folks should know of them. But I am a strong, strong believer. And certainly really in an era where the Supreme Court has determined that a corporation has free speech, then certainly individuals it's a sad have, era have for that. free speech. So my, that's my immediate response. Um, my concern about identifying them um, basically as alienated um, potential mental health issues goes back to my previous discussion about what is a terror attack. So do we understand that a, a white kid uh, going and sitting with AME parishioners and then murdering them is somehow alienated and disaffected and didn't like his parents, but uh, the Muslim who shoots somebody is motivated by an ideology, right? And we have this, and it's, it's built into the law. Well, I think they all yeah. feel they have an ideology. Right, but usually, the, you know, the, the white, the white very, the response very often to the white is um, a mental health question, mm. an alienation question. Mm. The response usually to a person of color who commits an act, a hideous, horrific act, is a terrorist or some kind of ideological background. Now, I'm not trying to make a political point. That's for other people to make. But I'm just trying to see if we're trying to make connections, we might look at the ideological components of all of them. And as well, ISIS, ISIS uses multimedia, right? ISIS uses the web to, to recruit. ISIS uses the web. So there are a lot more parallels, I think, and overlappings. Uh, I'll give you a not very good parallel, but for example, by law, uh, the United States cannot act against what is considered a genocide until it is legally considered a genocide. Who decides that? It's, that's federal law. Who uh, the, decides, government, the government. Who the decides? The State is Department, it? President, and Congress decide. Mm. And, and again, no, no cheap point. I'm just saying how important these titles are. Right? A massacre is a horrible thing. Uh, but it's does not it need, a genocide. Right, but does it need to be a genocide for people to help? I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, going into a pizza place, a cafe, a synagogue, a mosque, a 7-Eleven. Look, we had one here, remember, Xerox, right? The Xerox uh, killings. He was angry at his boss. Right. He may be angry at his boss. Um, who, who knows what else, you know, was going on, but... Well, mental health as well. Okay, you know. yeah, and, and access to weapons, right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in other words, um, I would keep social media up and running, <laughs> but I'd be, I would try to monitor, you know, what motivates these people. Um, mm -hmm. Alienation can be... You know, alienation can also lead you to go to a poetry retreat and into, mm -hmm. you know, 40 years of silence. So I, I think, you know, alienation does not have to lead to murder, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, alienation leads to murder when you have the technology to murder people. It's very interesting. Yeah. This, is, this raises uh, in my mind a movie that I recently saw about that young fellow in Norway. Right. Who, uh, he, he was also disaffected and isolated, and uh, he didn't know what he was doing. Uh, well, but he had some connections to the far right, clearly. He, yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. far right. Yeah. And he was trying to save Norway and democracy as he saw it. Right. You know? uh, we're going to take a short break, sure. Peter. But when we come back, uh, I'd like to pursue one thing you mentioned about monitoring, monitoring social mm -hmm. media, monitoring the web. 
And whether this is something that maybe the Anti-Defamation League or other Jewish organizations or other individual Jews should be involved in, just to be aware and to find out, um, you know, where the possible violence might come from. Uh, we'll be right back okay. after this break. And Peter Hoffenberg. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Hi, I'm Bill Sharp, host of Asian Review here on Think Tech Hawaii. Join me every Monday afternoon from 5 to 5.30 Hawaii Standard Time for an insightful discussion of contemporary Asian affairs. There's so much to discuss, and the guests that we have are very, very well informed. Just think, we have the upcoming negotiation between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un. The possibility of Xi Jinping, the leader of China, remaining in power forever. We'll see you then. Okay, we're back. We're live with Peter Hoffenberg. We're talking about bigotry in America. Uh, post the Pet Pittsburgh attack, the status of anti-Semitism in America. And uh, the question left hanging before the break is, uh, so uh, what, what exactly can we do to monitor? Uh, because, because if I tell you uh, that Gab or any of these other, you know, hate organizations, mm -hmm. call it free speech, you know, but it's hate, um, you know, are, are, is a gathering place for people like Mike Enoch or uh, Richard uh, Bowers. Bowers. Right. Uh, then I need to go there. I need to. I need to be in that room too. I need to look and see who's playing, who's who's making outrageous statements, and maybe uh, maybe I should talk to the FBI because <laughs> they may not be following it. They may not realize it. <clears throat> Can I help them? Should I help them? What do I do to, to monitor? All right, well, let me give you a, a slightly different answer, and then I'll get, then I'll get right to yours. Um, the best <laughs> response to bad magic is good magic. <laughs> and I think that while people complain a lot about social media, they fall very quickly into the trap of kvetching, targeting, even if well-intended. I think the social media is a tool that well-intentioned people need to seize back and to help drown out in social media with more responsible, endearing, uh, well-intended. Okay, so that's one response, which is, I think, a very important response, because one of the things you asked me to think about is how we should, as a Jewish community, respond to this. And one of the reasons I thought the Kaddish was so helpful is it is a celebration of life. You know, so go to shul, be Jewish, be active on social media, using it for the benefits. I mean, uh, in a way, social media is like one of those uh, medicines which, all right, if it's not taken properly, it probably will hurt you. But it's also medicine that could save you. So should I go so on secondly, Gab? I gonna, should I go on well, Gab okay. and participate? Now, secondly, um, I'll give you a, well, there's a, kind of a legal and a personal response. My personal response is I don't want anything to do with it. I don't want them to have my information. I don't really want to know uh, what they're thinking about, and I don't really want to swim in those piranha <clears throat> waters. Now, having said that, personally, I think uh, I would be very surprised if the Anti-Defamation League does not monitor that. Um, I think the government now is a little bit more aware of non-foreign domestic terror acts, and perhaps a lot of these things surprised uh, the FBI and other uh, legal and policing agencies, not for any nefarious reason, but the focus, the money, et cetera, has been addressing allegedly foreign, right? Yeah. And so those are only 24 hours in a day. Yeah. So I would certainly hope that uh, Congress would increase the funding for, not censorship, remember, we're not talking about censorship, and you, you, know, you, need a, if, you, you do need a, some kind of warrant if you want to do anything but at least have people listen. I think that's always a good idea, to know what's, what's out there. But I, I vehemently oppose shutting them down, vehemently. I remember that fellow in Europe, uh, I'm blocking his name too, uh, who was the Nazi hunter, 
Mm -hmm. uh, he's t his, his, his company, his organization. Well, Simon Wiesenthal, perhaps? Yeah, Wiesenthal. Right, who passed away several years ago. And, yeah. And, um, but he still has... His, Rabbi Heyer is basically still in, L doing in L.A. his successor. Yeah. Right. So I, mean, I think it's uh, interesting to go after Nazis uh, all these years later. But I think it's also interesting, maybe more interesting, to go after people who are vir virulent anti-Semites and maybe organizations like ADL and the Simon Wiesenthal Center um, should devote a little time and energy to looking at the web, looking at the, the, dark, the dark part of the web, and trying to identify who's who. Well, they do, and so does the Southern Poverty Law Center. Uh, um, anti, the anti Southern Poverty Law Center is involved in anti-Semitic yes, statements. Yes, yes. Morris Dees, uh, who was founded in the mid-60s. Uh, I would not say that anti-Semitism is at the top of their list, yeah. but they, they are the one that has consistently monitored hate groups. Mm. And among those hate groups, as we know, are those that target Jews. But they target Catholics, so should we leave it to them? Y um, yes, my view is to leave it to people who know what they're doing. Yes, and to remember that as long as, as long as we have the Constitution the way we have the Constitution, and people may disagree with it, this society is not geared for preventative measures. So, society, society, so, so for example, we know a Nazi committed an act and now we go after. How do you know that Mr. and there are Ms. as well, like the couple that shot the police in Nevada, how do we know that they're gonna do anything? We, we just don't, and our society is geared for um, response, not prevention, right? I mean, for example, and again, I don't, uh, this is a, just a policy statement, not a moral statement. You know, if you're really worried, for example, about uh, unwed mothers or children, et cetera, then have pro prophylactic devices available to people, right? But this country would prefer to worry about things afterwards. Yeah, we're, we're, just, we're, not a, we're not a society, and that may be baked into our DNA, you know, that this is a society where freedom seems so important in so many different ways to so many people that they're less inclined. And that's one of the difficulties. I mean, you can't... Around gun control, certainly. Gun control, but I think a lot of, a lot of issues. I mean, uh, a lot of things that uh, lead to, uh, well, slavery was most obvious, <laughs> right? Yeah. Not resolving that until 700,000 people well, were is it, killed. Is it, is it resolved now? No, no. Well, racism <laughs> is not, right. Absolutely not. But I mean, that's a good case of, you know, let's, let's see how it plays out rather than let's stop it. And so we, I'm Jewish. I'm at a party here yeah. in the Christmas season. I, I'm going to use the word Christmas right. to define the season. And I'm sitting at the dinner table and somebody makes a comment about, you know, you know, even even um, uh, neo Nazis. You know, there's there's some good neo Nazis. Mm -hmm. They're okay. I know some myself. You know, they're all right. right. Now, what do I do? Do I just do I just cringe inside? Do I lose my dinner, or do I say something? And if I say something, what do I say, Peter? Is it the host or not? <laughs> okay, so check if it's the host or not. All right, and I would prefer to respond to that after drinks, after I've had the full meal. But no, I mean that's that's an absurdity. I mean there there are certain absurdities. If you if you march with a tiki torch, and deliberately uh, target African Americans in the state of Virginia, and say Jews will not replace us, no, there's no good there. There's no good. Okay, and that's a position I think uh, is what do you do? Get up, leave. Well, um, my being, you know, myself, I would say something. <laughs> what yeah. would you say? I would say that's that's not true. If you if you if you embrace neo Nazism, meaning racism, uh, fascism, terror. I mean, the point of it was terror, right? It's a nighttime march. The point was to terrorize people. No, there, there's nothing good. You know, that's. That's the old saying. That's the, the George Wallace saying, right? You know, some of my friends are African Americans, <laughs> so I'm really a good guy. Uh, would you have an argument? Um, I think it, it depends upon your relationship. I mean, which is not much of an answer to you, but you know, you don't want to go home regretting that you had the argument. Well, you know, it, the thought occurs to me if somebody said that with me, right? I mean, I'm emotionally involved. Sorry to say, I yeah, am. Yeah, that's, um, you'd probably say then something. I would unfriend that person. Yeah. I would say, we're done. I, I can't tolerate this. I can't tolerate you. I'm sorry. Goodbye. Right. Well, it certainly are some limits, and I think maybe the difference over the last two years has been, um, as I said at the beginning with Gentleman's Agreement and the N-word, that were limits, that were generally accepted limits. That's what's happened in the past two years or so. Uh, there are no limits. It's like the id 
the it is just all over the place, and yeah. the ego, the ability to control yeah. that. Because look, I mean, nobody, nobody, you know, five, six years ago would have had that march in Charlottesville. Now there have been there have been confrontations. There certainly have been confrontations. But not like that. But not like that. Um, so, would I unfriend them? Um, I'm not sure I'd be at dinner with them to begin with. <laughs> okay, <laughs> see, I'd go to a Hanukkah party. Uh, but uh, no, I, th I think you're right to say, look, there are certain things that really are beyond. They're just not acceptable. They really are beyond the pale, because we're talking about. Uh, we're not talking about politics here. In that case, we're really talking about society. Right. Like, can you live together? Right. Can your kids go to school together? Right. Uh, can you be on the bus together? You know, I, and it's probably. One of the reasons that like people get along in New York because you're in the subway, you know you got to get along. Yeah. Everywhere else we're in a car, and you can be swearing and everything, and there's not that connection. And we had that false connection with social media. Yeah. Last question, Peter. Of course, we're almost out of time, and that is uh, one of the articles that I've seen this week um, had to do with uh, the, you know uh, the, the relationship of uh, people who feel that. Uh, who, who do not understand the Holocaust. They mm -hmm. do not understand it. They may know it happened. They may admit it happened. Sometimes they don't even do that. Um, but they don't know the detail. They don't know the enormity of it. Okay? Uh, with people who are more tolerant of uh, neo-Nazism, neo-fascism, how are you? Um, so that calls for education. It, it calls for education. And uh, is, it, is it something that, that a Jewish person should do? Is it something the Jewish community should do? to actually educate the public, who has, sadly enough, not had a proper education on that subject? The short answer is, of course, yes. Uh, the long answer, and that we can come back and talk about, is whether that really makes a difference or not, right? Um, but certainly, uh, having a high school equivalency degree or a college degree and not having a, a basic you know, two paragraphs about American slavery, and a basic two paragraphs about the Holocaust, and a basic two paragraphs about Native Americans, yeah, then you're not getting the proper education. But there's not necessarily uh, unqualified evidence that that will then lead to people being more tolerant. No, especially if it, it, should, it, 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 usually doesn't do, it usually doesn't do the reverse, though. You, education usually doesn't make people less tolerant. Yeah. It may not change. Uh, the difficulty, as those three communities know, though, um, that sometimes education leads to resentment. And you've seen a lot of resentment the last two years. Uh, we have nothing to apologize for, but we need to think through how it's presented. And the Holocaust is a very difficult proposition because when you teach it, particularly people who have no particular uh, connection to it, it's often universalized, so it's like every other genocide, and it's quite often given a, a Christian narrative. So a disproportionate number of students and teachers who uh, went to and visited the U.S. Holocaust Museum on a tour, so presumably they didn't go to every single room, but they went through the official tour, uh, when they had a survey afterwards, a disproportionate number of them thought the best analogy for the European Jews was Jesus. That the European Jews had died for a greater reason on a cross, essentially. Boy. So to complicate it, right, you have a classroom curriculum. It probably doesn't lead to less tolerance, but it may lead to universalizing. And by universalizing, you're really not doing anybody a favor. We saw this past week where you could read a lot of well-intentioned pieces and not know that those 11 people were killed because this guy hated Jews, right? He hated in general. Uh, he had guns in general. He was a bigot in general. But you can't erase, you should not erase the fact that this was uh, Jew hatred. And because they were in a synagogue, it was probably also hatred of Judaism, not just of Jews. One last thing, I, I really have to ask you this before we mm -hmm. close, and that is, make look at camera one over camera there. One. That, okay. Camera one, right, right in the middle. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. That, right in the middle. That's that's um, that's camera the public, one. such as okay. it is. That's the public, and I'm just sure there's some Jews out there in the public might be watching this discussion. I mean, if I were a member of that audience, I would I would want to hear what you have to say. But what about the the, the non-Jews, the non-Jews who are watching our discussion? What would you like them to carry away today from this discussion, Peter? 
like to carry away the, the long history of anti-Semitism, and that has been against both Jews as an ethnic group or a political group, and the religion itself, which has always been characterized by a couple of crucial issues, and then we'll call it a day because this is getting late. Everybody who hates Jews has always talked about a conspiracy. So these folks at the shul were in a conspiracy with the Hebrew Immigration Association to bring in refugees. It's a conspiracy, right? A disproportionate amount of power among a very small group of people. It is extrapolated overseas to be Israel, a small country, regardless of whether you agree with the policies or not, a small country, which as critics are always saying has a disproportionate amount of power in America. So I'd like them to think about the long history. I'd like them to think about the conspiracy aspects, whether it's secular or religious, and also that probably in the long history of Judaism and Jews, America is and still continues to be the best place, the easiest, the safest place to be Jewish. And among those reasons are some uh, very important marriages between Jewish values and enduring uh, American values. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Peter Hoffman. Thank you. Great to have this discussion. Always. Great to have you down here. Um, anytime. My yeah, pleasure. There's more. There's more to talk about. We will. Thank, Thank you. Very so good. Much. Okay. Thank you. Aloha.